Before the communion service, if any of you have children with you tonight, it's entirely in your hands whether they take communion or not. You should know where the child is in Jesus Christ. My own feeling is, it's better that they should wait until they're older than taking it when they're younger. But the responsibility is yours and not mine. When we have communion in Jesus Focus Ministry, this is for every one of you who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And there's no restriction, because it's between you and Him. And those of you with children, will you observe that, please? I want to talk to you tonight about believers and their tongues. Isn't that exciting? <clears throat> for a preparation for communion, in James 3 and verse 2 we find these words. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what they say, they are a perfect person, able to keep their whole body in check. Do you want me to read it again? <laughs> I warn you, next week we're going on in chapter 3 and it gets worse. But I'd never seen it quite like this before. I think it's because it's the New International Version and it gives a different light. We all stumble in many ways. If anyone is never at fault in what they say, they're a perfect person able to keep their whole body in check. Now this is to sort us out before we come to the table. And there's a lot here for us to look at. First of all, notice, we all continue to sin. We all continue to sin. That's the first part of the verse. We all stumble in many ways. And I don't think it's necessary for me to go through a list. You know what it is. But once you become a Christian believer, it doesn't mean that sinning has ended. We still sin. But what should happen is this. That the moment we sin, we become aware of it. We know what to do about it. We get cleaned up and we get on with living. And the more you walk with Jesus Christ, the more conscious you should become of that, and the more quickly you should go to Him in repentance and confession. We sin in many different ways. We sin through our thoughts, our actions, our words, and our attitudes. And because of this, we all need times of confession. I still believe it. I think the Protestants have missed out on this. We know that Confessions is for the Roman Catholics. I don't think that's true. I believe we need it just as much. And we find in James 5 and verse 16, words that many of you know very well, but I think we need to hear them again. Therefore, confess your sins to each other, and pray for each other, so that you may be healed. That's got to be very real. And that's got to be from the heart. If you're coming to the Lord your God to confess, it's got to be what the Roman Catholic Church calls true sorrow. Because if you don't mean what you're saying, you are absolutely wasting your time and His. Because you can come to me and we can share in prayer and you can confess. And you may fool me, but you're not fooling Him. And the confession has to be true, and the confession has to be from the heart. Now, when we come and truly mean what we say in confession, a number of things happen. First of all, sometimes confession should be alone. And sometimes it should be with a trusted Christian friend. And sometimes the release is never there until we do confess to another person in the presence of our Lord. And if you say to me, Richard, my life is so private, I would never do that. I think, dear friend, you're missing something. For I see what a breakthrough there is when an individual confesses in the presence of the Lord with somebody else. Also, sometimes confession brings physical healing. That's part of it. And always, confession brings spiritual healing. And it can't miss. In the first letter of John, chapter 1, and verse 7, we find the Bible says this, If we walk in the light as Jesus is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ purifies us from all sin. And then verse 9 says this, 
If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. But it doesn't happen until we confess. Confession is an absolute must. But also there are times of repentance. After confession, we must come to con repentance. What do I mean? What's the difference? They sound very much alike. I think if we're true in our repentance, we say to the Lord, I'm sorry for what I've done wrong, and mean it. I'm sorry for what I've done wrong, and we mean it. It's from the heart. The second part of repentance is similar. When we truly repent, we're saying, Lord, I'm going to do everything I possibly can not to do that again. You can't come in confession and repentance and then go straight out and do the same thing. Again, if you do that, you're just fooling yourself. True confession is, I'm sorry and I'll do everything I can to avoid doing that again. I believe also to live in this world and to be part of it and yet not to be part of it, something else has to happen. There has to be continual cleansing. You can't just come once and it's done forever. You have to come again and again and again to the Lord Jesus and you have to be cleansed again and again. We find this in James chapter 4 verses 7 and 8. It says here, Submit then to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts you double-minded. You see, if you're living with Jesus and thinking and acting like the world, you're double-minded and you need cleansing. You're a sinner. For one thing in the life in Jesus Christ is single-mindedness. And that can be hard. It can be tough. And I receive this cleansing through confession and repentance, but I also receive it through the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ. And this is what I just read to you from 1 John 1 7. It says, And the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from every sin. When I come to Jesus, and when I celebrate the communion, and I take that cup, I'm remembering that the blood of Jesus has cleansed me from every sin and that sacrifice was total, sufficient and complete in Jesus. That's why we don't need any other sacrifice. That's why when you hear someone say, Oh, I've got this sickness and I'm suffering for the Lord. That's wrong theology. That's nonsense. When Jesus died, he did it all. Who do you think you are to help him? That's not true. You may do your own self-suffering, but it's nothing to do with Jesus. When Jesus died, his atonement was complete, sufficient, total. And he cleanses us from all sin. Also notice that we're cleansed through the Word of God. Now, obviously, we're not cleansed through the Word of God unless we read it. But as we read the Word and it becomes part of us, it has a cleansing effect. And you can find this in Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26. This is where he's writing about husbands and wives. And he says this, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the Word. As you read the Word of God, it has a cleansing and purifying effect in your life. But if you're a Christian who has it neatly put away in a box so it doesn't get soiled, the cleansing can't take place. The second part of the verse is fascinating. It says to me, we must all guard our tongues. Now I can, I'm sure, this is easier for some than others. And I had a real struggle with this and had to work on it and I talked to you about it. It says, if anyone is never at fault in what they say, they are a perfect person. And that's not easy at all times. And some of you struggle with that, don't you? Let me give you one or two thoughts. I talked to you some time ago about the tongue and I reminded you 
our words are creative. And that's the danger. Our words are creative. Because you and I have been made in God's image, when we speak, that word goes out to create good or evil. And whenever you speak, you'll never get it back. You can publish an apology on the front of the bulletin, or if you can't afford it, in the front of the intelligentsia, but you'll never get it back. And what you said sticks in someone's mind, and next time they see that person, they think, now what did I hear? What did I hear about that? It's the word, and it's creative. Now, I think the logic of this is very clear. God, when he spoke, was creative. Turn to Genesis chapter 1, what does it say? God said, let there be light. God said, God said, God said, and every time he spoke it happened. And I'm sorry to tell you, but every time you speak, and I speak, it still happens. And the sad part is, that some of the things that come out of our mouths are not of God. Also notice, the Lord our God has done such a wonderful work in us that whenever he spoke, whatever he said was good and true. Now if I am to be his person, what comes out of my mouth and what comes out of your mouth must also be good and it must be truth. And the sad fact is, I guess all of us, at times, all that comes out of our mouth is not like that. And we need purifying, and we need cleansing, and we need to be on our guard. On Thursday mornings with the men's group, we've been studying the Gospel of Mark. And we came on something very fascinating. Our words express what's within us. Our words express what's within us. We find this in Mark chapter 7 and verse 20, and it's Jesus speaking. And Jesus is sharing with the people some things that are, get very heavy. It says, he went on, What comes out of a person is what makes them unclean. For from within, out of a person's heart come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. All these evils come from inside and make a person unclean. How do they come? Basically through our words. And as those words come out, they express our personality. They express our character. What comes out? You find this at work. You're working with someone who really has some problems and every time they speak, something comes out and you you begin to see what's inside them. Also, our thoughts are expressed in our words as well as in our actions. And because of this, I believe with all my heart, our words need to be committed, our tongues need to be committed to the control of the Holy Spirit. And I think until you do that, you're going to have tremendous problems. Your tongue, my tongue, our words need to be committed to the control of the Holy Spirit. Because you can't let up on this. It's incredible as you read through the scripture to see what Jesus said about it. Let me read you a little something from Matthew 12 and verse 37. And it's Jesus speaking again. And he says, for by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Then we better get our words straight. And we better let the Holy Spirit control our words, our tongues at all times. Because Jesus said that. And you see, the fruit of the Holy Spirit will never be evidenced through a life where the tongue is not under control. And I assume, it's certainly true for me, the one thing I want to know is that the fruits of the Holy Spirit begin to be evidenced in my life. But if my tongue's wrong, that can't happen. I'm going to keep on blowing it. 
The tongue is so vital. Secondly, the Holy Spirit does not control me unless he controls my words. Many of you here, if not most of you here, claim to live under the Holy Spirit. You claim to be filled by the Holy Spirit. Fine. Then in that case, he must control the tongue. He must control my words. And what comes out of me must be creative for the Holy Spirit. Now, if what I've said to you is true, we dare not go further in this service until we have a time of confession. And I don't know what's in your heart, and I don't know where you're wrong with him, but I know this. You've got to put it right before you dare take this. For if you come to take this communion, knowing that the sin in your heart, you become guilty of putting Jesus on the cross. And if you stop and think of what I've just said, whether you go to communion or whether you go to Mass, it is so vital. It's so incredibly important. And sometimes we can take it so lightly. But we've got to be clean. And what I want us to do is just, just spend a moment in quiet and just get with the Holy Spirit and ask Him to show you anything that's not right in your life. Let's pray. Now ask him to cleanse you, for the Bible says that when you ask, it is done. And all God's people say it. Now there's another area. As we pray with people and counsel with people, the first area we nearly always deal with is unforgiveness. Because this has a greater hold on Christian people than anything else in this world. And we've got to get it cleaned up. And what I want to do is just pray, and I'm going to ask the Lord to show you anyone against whom you have unforgiveness, whether it's bitterness or anger or jealousy or hurts, any of those things. The person may even have died, but the resentment's still there. I want you quietly to name that person to the Lord. And then we're going to pray. And if you would like to, I'm going to invite you to join in with me and send your love and blessing to that individual. And we'll ask the Father to send his love and blessing. And don't be alarmed as when I pray, if he shows you that you've got to name the person you're married to, and the children, and the grandchildren, sometimes yourself, and sometimes God. It's incredible the number of people that we pray with who really have unforgiveness towards the Lord our God. And you can't be cleaned up until you've got that right. Let's spend a moment in prayer and let the Lord show you. Our Heavenly Father, by your Holy Spirit, show us at this moment anyone against whom we have unforgiveness, whether it's jealousy or anger, hurts, resentment, bitterness, whatever it is, that we may be clean in your sight. Now, if you feel free to do so, join me in this prayer. Lord Jesus, I send my love and my blessing to each one I've named. And I ask you to send your love and your blessing to them at this moment. Take away all my wrong attitudes. Cleanse me completely, and I receive your forgiveness, and I acknowledge that all my guilt is taken away in Jesus.
and I thank you. Amen.